ゃあ始めますか。あ、聞こえる<笑>あ、これどうすりゃいいんだろう了解すれば。了解。これどう,どうやったら了解できるかリターン。リターンで大丈夫あ、リターン違う。あ、多分ポイントが外れる。あ一回レーザーポイント外されてるんですけど、ね。はい。はい。で、どうですか今、どこにいるはい。レーザーポイントはコントロールでいけるんです。じゃあ、始めましょうかね。はい。じゃあ、グッドイブニング。So, my name is Kengo Nakajima.、Uh, the title of my talk is、uh, Innovative Scientific Computing by Integration of Simulation Data Learning. It's plus D. What is it? It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. So, this is the history of our systems. And、uh, so, we are now in the mid of the fiscal year of the 2022. So, recently,、uh, we have one system with accelerators、uh, such as GPUs, and this continues in the future. Supercomputing is changing now. So, we have new types of workloads related to big data analytics, AI, and machine learning, in addition to CSE for simulation. Integration and convergence of simulation data and learning, S plus T plus L, is important towards Society 5.0. Super smart、uh, and human centered society by integration of cyberspace and physical space. Since 2015, We have been developing a new platform for integration of S plus D plus L, which is called BDEC, Big Data and Extreme Computing. We are focusing on S. Our approach is based on AI for HPC, AI for Science, and Digital Twin. We share BDEC z e r o is the first BDEC system, which is a platform for integration of S plus D plus L. Peak performance is 33.1 petaflops and aggregated memory bandwidth is 8.38 petabytes per second. The system is constructed by Fujitsu. Operation started on May 14, 2021, and it is a hierarchical, hybrid, and heterogeneous system with two types of nodes. Simulation nodes for HPC, Odessa, with more than 25 petaflops, is based on Fujitsu's prime HPC FX1 sensor. With 864 FX with high bandwidth memory. So, this part has the same architecture as Ugaka. Data and running nodes, Aquarius, a GPU cluster consisting of Intel i s r a c e and NVIDIA AR100 tensor core, with 7.2 petaflops for data analytics. AI and machine learning workloads,、uh, some of data and running nodes are connected to external resources directly. So, this is the ranking at the ISU 2022 in last June. So, Odessa is 20th of the top 500 pieces. So, this is how we utilize the Wisteria BDX run system for integration of simulation data and learning. Models are, and parameters for simulation are optimized by data analytics and machine learning. Thus, we can accelerate the procedures for parameter studies in real world non linear simulation. HRE Open BDEC、uh, is an innovative software、yeah. uh, platform for integration of S plus D plus L on BDEC systems. So,、uh, it is a five year project supported by Japanese government since 2019. PI is by t e l s and the total budget is
So this slide over is an adaptive pressure computing is in the 21. Adaptive pressure computing by the 260 has been traditionally used for scientific Single pressure is widely used in static classroom programming for F6. Moreover, half pressure of F60 is also introduced uh, recently. While F60 is originally used for machine learning computations, uh, it is not suitable for scientific computing stability. So, in this project, uh, we develop an uh, intermediate process in the program and the Currently, the 21 and 42 evaluation is done for a different あの、<笑> Okay, sorry. Okay, so this slide shows the result of the preliminary works for the uh, prediction of the transient CFD simulation by machine learning and the convolutional neural network. The current result shows a good agreement between a 2D lattice correspondence simulations and CNN predictions. We also have the third pillar of this project software and utility for heterogeneous environments, uh, such as Wisteria VDX01. Actually, Wisteria VDX01 is the first really heterogeneous system in the world. Here, I will talk about the coupler. Generally, multi-physics coupler, such as PP Open Math MP, is uh, doing weak coupling of multiple applications. But our new coupler, H3 Open UT MP, has more sophisticated capabilities. We are developing a new coupler which combines Odessa for simulations and Aquarius for AI machine learning. Because the Wisteria VDX run is a heterogeneous, a single MPI job over Odessa and Aquarius is impossible. Actually, they are connected through infiniband EDR with two terabytes uh, per second. We are developing a, a, a communication uh, procedures with HCD open sys with IO socket. So it's a library for inter-process communications with MPI-like interface. H3 open sys weight IO socket enables direct communication between Odessa and Aquarius through InfiniBand EDI. This is the API for the uh, communication library, uh, weight IO socket. So its interface is, is very similar to that of MPI. Weight IO socket was open for public this June. So we are also developing a weight IO through file systems. So this is a, so I just show you the, our preliminary works in the weight IO file. Uh, we have already developed a weight IO socket through InfiniBand network uh, like this. Okay. So we are also developing a weight IO file uh, through uh, fast file systems. So this is a preliminary evaluation. Uh, blue line shows uh, time for a weight IO socket. Orange line shows weight IO file on Wisteria VDX01. Socket is better for small uh, cases and file is better for large ones. So this slide overviews a 3D aspect simulation with a real-time data observation and assimilation on Wisteria VDX01 using H3 Open VDX. We utilize real-time data from more than 1,000 observation points through site. So this is a system on Wisteria VDX01 using weight IO library. Aquarius is uh, doing the filtering and visualization, while Odyssey is doing uh, simulations and uh, data simulation. So this slide shows code written by Fortran 
calling Great IO Library. Aquarius is sending the result uh, of filtering, and Odessa receives the data. The next part, I will introduce our ongoing work for a coupling of scientific simulations on Odessa and AI workload on Aquarius using our Capra and Great IO Library. So this slide shows an example for the atmosphere simulations of clouds by my colleagues. So this simulation includes two parts. One is a high resolution model for the detailed simulations. Another uh, is coarser model for parameterization. So this time uh, we replace the coarse method, a coarse model uh, for parameterization with AI. So this part requires 20%, 25% of the total computation time. So the target uh, is, uh, in this study is a uh, microphysical procedures of cloud. The data-driven cloud model uh, predicts atmospheric state changes per time. In this machine learning process, air density, uh, internal energy, and density of water, water vapor are the input. And the gradient in time direction is the output. PyTorch is used as a framework for machine learning uh, on Aquarius. And uh, multi-layer perceptron uh, with uh, three layers was applied. Right-hand side is an uh, input, middle is a simulation, and the uh, right-hand side is an uh, output by uh, inference. So generally, uh, simulations and AI agree well, but the uh, reproducibility of the extreme value needs improvement. So next, I'll talk about the future uh, perspective. So we are shifting to GPUs in next 10 years. So this is essential for maximum performance under constraint of power and energy consumption. So we are introducing OFP2 system under collaboration with the University of Tsukuba in April 2024. We expect more than 200 petaflops peak performance, and it consists of the GPU cluster and CPU only part. Before that, we are introducing a small cluster, Wisteria Mercury, uh, and OFP2 and Wisteria Mercury are equipped with same GPUs. Floating calls more, uh, of more than 3,000 users of the previous system, OFP, with Intel Xeon 5 to GPU is the most critical issue. So we just started to do this. So finally, I talk about a little bit about the successor of the Wisteria VDEC 01. So VDEC 02 uh, will start in five or six years from now. So we keep the direction of the Wisteria VDEC 01 towards integration of S plus D plus L. So this will be a GPU focused system with a combination of GPU clusters and CPU cluster. Moreover, so we are thinking about uh, introducing DPU, IPU, quantum inspired devices, and uh, multiple types of GPUs for supporting workloads for data and learning. So such devices may be on cloud. Programming environment and the computational library uh, for integration of HPC and such devices are needed. So where we can extend the idea of weight IO even to the cloud environment. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Let's 
聞こえます<笑>聞こえない。<笑>聞こえない。<笑>聞こえてます<笑>そうですかあ、そうですか<笑>すみません。えーはい、これ入り替えるとまたこっちも入れ替えるおお<笑>これをだから、メインとエクステンドを入れ替えればいい。これをあれですかと思いますけど。サムソンをメイン。あ、でも、えっと、そうか、ミラーにしちゃダメなんですよ。ミラーでもいいと思います。ちょっとやってみます。はい。どうですかあ,あ、これ。一回共有止めて、えっ、ー、と、共有だけ外して、うん、はい、ストップシェアして、もう一度、シェアにして、それをそっちを、はい。それで、それでもう一度。はい、すみません。OK。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。I think this is a kind of very introduction to the graph. I mean, as you know, um, vertex and edge is actually, I mean, it's a simple data structure that we can represent as for real applications, right? Um, then it's a graph is everywhere. For example, if you know it's a cycle detection or community detection, it's a, you know, the, this kind of graph algorithm, right? So then um, we are kind of shifting graph algorithm to a uh, neural network based approach, which is called a uh, graph neural networks. And if, with the graph neural networks, we can just run the graph structure data uh, using graph ne neural networks without uh, learning, without defining a feature uh, by, by yourself. So um, here is kind of like an old time, the kind of like a visualization uh, of the uh, Twitter social network. Uh, so we actually collected uh, pretty, I think, big uh, network. It's actually 800 million vertices and then uh, 29 billion edges. Uh, so we collected those kind of social network before, and then we just, uh, using supercomputers, we analyze social network uh, natures. And then another um, is a visualization that we are working on is uh, this is a, uh, it's a flight network uh, during the COVID-19. So um, you can you can see some, I, I don't know, it's actually, it's a, uh, so after, I mean, if you can see after March-ish, uh, the flight is gonna be, uh, it's kind of de decreasing over time. For example, you can see that, okay, so number of flights just kind of decreasing a little bit. So after March, and then all the, the most of the flights actually just uh, I mean, disappear, right? So this is a visualization that uh, we can see during the COVID-19. And let me go. And then what, what is graph neural network? So GNN or graph neural network is a 
uh, it's some kind of toolkit uh, for representation learning on a graph. So given a graph, and then we want to learn the embedding vectors of the nodes or edges so that we can we can get this kind of vector so that we can just use this vector for let's say similarity of no uh, similarity of nodes or edges uh, and so on. Right? And so this is a nutshell of the graph neural network, uh, neural net, graph neural net nets here. So given the graph, and then let's say we wanna um, we wanna compute the known embedding of the A, and then we're gonna we're gonna construct this kind of neural network like this. So given so A neighbors of A is gonna be B C D, and the neighbors B is A C or something, right? So then based on the feature representation here, we're gonna gradually aggregate all the features coming from layer zero to layer one. And then we actually apply this kind of uh, linear, non-linear functionality here. And we, we actually gradually learning this kind of representation based on the label data that this node has. So this is a nutshell of the graph neural net networks. Right? So based on, I mean, Based on this kind of intuition, this is a, a mathematical formulation of the graph, new, graph neural networks. Uh, sorry. So, based on that, let's say H is a hidden representation of the uh, node. And then starting from zero, and then we're going to sum up the representation vectors. And then we're going to pass to nonlinear application here. And then we need to pass the next layer of H here. So, this is a uh, kind of introduction to the mathematical formulation of GNNs. And, and then, so uh, we have, we are kind of working on different applications, for example, such as uh, fraud detection in a, with a, in a financial institution, and then job recombination system in a, in a job matching uh, company. And then we are working with a, the, one of the largest economics company, uh, news company, uh, for news recommendation. And then we are working with uh, the mobile uh, the mobility company uh, for POI, which is a point of interest recommendation. And then lastly, uh, so multi discovery is one of the, uh, the important applications that we are working on. Okay. So one of the, the um, um, important application in the financial institution is how do you find um, bad guys in a transaction network? So this is a real uh, financial transaction. And then given the financial transactions, we need to actually, that color is a bad transaction that actually committed by the bad guys, right? So then task is how to find this kind of uh, red color activities uh, from the billions of transactions uh, in a real time. Right? So, um, so we have some kind of hypothesis that, okay, bad guys are connected to bad guys. Is that, that's it. So there's a hypothesis that, okay, so bad guys is connected to bad guys. And then we are like learning those kind of bad behaviors with the neural networks. And then this is a result that we can, uh, uh, we can get uh, using GNN. So compared to the baseline, uh, which is actually more like a rule-based system, and then using neural network approach, and then we can just reduce 26% reduction uh, using GNN. So we um, actually, I, I, I was in a project and they apply in, the, in a, a real financial institutions. And okay. So then this is another application that, that for fraud detection. So we, we are, since, uh, banking transaction data is pretty private, and then we are working. We are using open data sets, which is from Ethereum, uh, the, the cryptocurrency world. And, and then, uh, third application is uh, this is uh, actually all the networks of the uh, uh, public companies in Japan. So, using uh, this uh, public information, we actually concatenate all the relationship between the companies. And then, so this is uh, all the supply chain. And then using the all the supply chain network, we want to predict what the market is going to be uh, using a GNN. So hypothesis that, okay, so given, let's say Toyota is, is there, and then Denso is there. 
if the Toyota is just uh, can sell a lot of companies and then Denso can just make a money, could make a money, right? So this is a hypothesis. So using this kind of propagation rule, and then we learn this kind of propagation rule using GNN, and then we are actually uh, work, working on the market prediction with the use, using GNN. And then uh, this is uh, actually the, the profit. Uh, okay, so using uh, using real data, and then this is uh, actually the baseline, which is a very pretty simple rule. And then using long uh, long short term memory, which is a uh, uh, you know, so this is the average uh, percentage of the uh, profits. And then using our graphs uh, approach, and then we can just achieve four uh, percent improvement. So, yeah, that that's it. And, and then, so another application is job matching itself. Let's say, given uh, so we are working on the one of the job matching company, and then they provide uh, data. Uh, okay, so let's say there is a job seekers and then jo there are the job uh, providers, right? So how to maximize actually the, uh, the matching between job seekers and job providers? And then since this is actually a bipartite graph and also dynamic, uh, dynamic change uh, uh, graph, and then we are, uh, we are doing optimization using new, uh, graph neural networks. So this is another application. And then, uh, so this is a the, then again, a nice visualization that we just mapped all the activities of the job matching the two Japan uh, Japan map. So you can see that matching between job seekers job providers actually is it's uh, it's ongoing in over time. Um, and and then this is another application that CNN can just make an important trade. So given the uh, trajectory data uh, provided by, uh, the, actually we can just go Toyota company. So we are working in Toyota company and then we got a uh, tremendous data from G, uh, the Toyota, right? So given the trajectory, we are kind of working on uh, something called a POI recommendation. POI means uh, point of interest. So if you are kind of, let's say travel to somewhere and then you want to, you want to get some recommendation, right, from Twitter.com or some kind of comp, right? So this is an application that we are working on. And let me just skip. So we are working on use recommendation, but, but let me skip. And, and then let me quickly um, touch the uh, another application that we can use for uh, for material informatics. So. Uh, materials informatics is see we want to uh, find new new uh, materials uh, right so the task is how to find the new uh, materials that has the new material 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 property so uh, in a traditional we actually computed the material properties using uh, the DFT simulation uh, density functional uh, theory simulation. Right? So using all the, the computing powers using uh, supercomputers, we actually compute DFT, uh, DFT simulation. So, but uh, with the neural network approach or GNN, uh, we are trying to build a uh, surrogate model for DFT simulation. So, so that's how, how that's where we are working on how to use GNN for mater material property prediction. And then we, so there is a, there is a benchmark called an OGB benchmark. OGB stands for open, uh, open graph benchmarking. Uh, so then, so this is the uh, yes, of the, the uh, ranking. So, uh, so uh, as you can see, transformer based approach is actually dominant uh, the model as you can see, right? So, so then we are kind of working, uh, we are kind of looking at the, how the performance looks like uh, with a graph format, uh, which is a, a transformer based approach. Um, let me just skip it, but, but transformer itself, um, as you might be aware, transformer architecture is, can be used uh, for NLP tasks or computer vision, recognition tasks and so on. So, I mean, we are kind of shifting, let's say for image recognition, we are shifting from CNN approach to uh, transformer architecture. Uh, right? And so 
one of the, the papers is going to be a mentioned how we can use transformer on feature to for the uh, property prediction in a model. So, sorry. Yeah, so, so let me just skip it, but, but uh, anyway, this is a, uh, okay, not shell. So the task is to say how to, given the graph like this, and then we wanna, we wanna get a computer property. Right? So, so this is actually, uh, we are doing performance graphics study here. So, the traditional uh, GNN approach, which is sort of GIN, we, we get a, uh, this kind of score, precision score, like 0 0.11 or something. This is actually uh, accuracy, right? So, if you use the transformer feature like graph or a complicated model like GM2, so, so we, we can just get a this kind of uh, decent, uh, uh, decent numbers, right? Compare compared to uh, the, the GIN approach. But if you if you can just take a look at this memory usage or uh, computation time, and then this is actually it's a it's a pretty pretty bad, right? Compared to uh, GIN approach, right? So so likewise, uh, it, it just indicates that okay, so. Um, in terms of the model, actually we can just get a better a better precision like this. But in terms of the efficiency or computational efficiency, this is actually shows pretty bad things. Right? So then, uh, as the next step, we are uh, we are working on you know, optimizing uh, this kind of trade off uh, of the this this metrics and this uh, this thing. Anyway, uh, so that's that's it. I think uh, as uh, in the summary, we just gonna. I just introduced GNN and its applications. And uh, if you have any questions, it's just uh, please just uh, email me. Okay. Thank you. So good now. So which, uh, test uh, go to page next page. Oh, stop. Oh no, it was working. It's working, yes. Okay. Hi, <laughs> this is. <clears throat> Ready? Okay, um, 
Thank you for invitation to come here and to give a presentation at the uh, University of Tokyo Information Technology Center booth. So I'm going to talk about parallel lagging solvers based on constraint minimization. This is a uh, uh, work that we have been doing for a few years now. I'll show you some of our previous work and where we stand right now. It's a collaboration involving Doruton Popovich, Mauro Del Ben, and Andrew Cunny, my colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Andrew is sitting right here. So if you have questions about the physics, he is in charge of answering them. Okay. So this is uh, with uh, this work is with funding from the Department of Energy SIDI Fast Math, Fast Math Institute. So the previous speaker already talked a little bit about density functional theory in the, using the, the neural network. Uh, so here we are also interested in the uh, DFT, density functional theory, but uh, we are interested in some of the eigenvalue problems that we have to solve. And there we talk about self-consistent loop where we start with uh, some trial vectors, we do some updates on some set of operators, we compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, of this operator, and then we have to iterate until basically we get convergence, typically in terms of energy that we're interested in, which means that the, the electronic system that we're looking at has converged to a stable configuration, a configuration that makes sense from the physics point of view. So uh, the, the, what we're interested in here is solving the eigenvalue uh, problem. Excuse me, the screen is not moving oh. on, the, on the net, so. Okay. Should I go back? <laughs> There's like some record it again if you need it. So the page change. Oh, Oops. Yeah, but yes. the, the, the screen is not too long. Oh, oh, okay. So um, we are basically interested in solving this eigenvalue problem that's marked in blue at the end of that cartoon. That's the self-consistent iteration loop. Normally, uh, we are going to, we, what we are interested in the eigenvalues, the energy levels and the uh, wave functions that are those psi that are basically, there is some discretization using in some cases in the real methods, finite elements or finite differences. Here we do everything in the complex field so basically we use some um, uh, uh, discretization like a Gaussian or fast, or fast Fourier or sinus and cosines. In order to solve that eigenvalue problem, some people, or you could try if the system is not big, could try to solve to use a direct method like those implemented in ScalePack, EigenExa, there in the RECAN, ELPA in Germany. But for the systems we are interested in, we're talking about iterative methods, in particular because we are interested in only 10 to 20% of the energy levels. That are the levels that make sense. More than that are uh, basically an artifact from the discretization. So uh, most eigenvalue problems using iterative strategies, they are they have problems with their, uh, the constraints that will tell you in a bit what it is, in, in, in the sense that you have at some point to take your big problem, project it into a smaller problem, make those pro take information from that small problem in order to make the iterates orthogonal, and that small problem doesn't scale well in particular in current systems. So then one approach is to, instead of solving an eigenvalue problem using kind of standard eigenvalue to solvers, we can cast the eigenvalue problem in terms of a minimization problem. And basically there are two strategies. The first one always uses some flavor of conjugate gradient. Uh, we are talking here about a linear, nonlinear conjugate gradient that involves some sort of nonlinear uh, minimization strategy inside the, the CG loop, the CG iterations. The first strategy is to, uh, to have a constraint on the iterates. Those are the psi. You, you try to keep those psi, the iterates orthogonal. And that's where we have the problem in the sense that we have to uh, do some calculations in a small subspace compared to the original size of the original problem. And that doesn't scale very well 
In particular, if you are using, say, the eigen scale impact, you could use the uh, eigenvalue decomposition or you could use the Adnell U factorization as well. Regardless, that's those calculations on the small subspace will not scale very well. Another strategy is to change the, the, the performance change of basis. We do some, we play a little bit with those size, we change the basis, and we manage to get, <laughs> get rid of the orthogonality constraints. So then we'll be iterating on a different subspace. On, so when you reach the minimum, the, those two subspaces, the constraint and the constraint, produce the same solutions, they need the same solutions at the minimum or at the minimum. Uh, but here, so when our, we when we relax, when we don't use the orthogonality constraint, basically we're talking about different or uh, 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 convergence uh, properties and so forth. But there is a number of uh, uh, references that have looked into this. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, for those of us that are more in, I think, in the numerical or the, the numerical field, it's interesting that I think the physicists have cast that problem more like in terms of optimization, because it's always, I think, in their minds, it's minimizing the energy. So therefore, I think that's the way that, you know, they like very much to use conservative gradients to minimize the energy instead of uh, uh, using an eigenvalue solver per se. And uh, actually, the conjugate gradient, what I have seen in the simulations that we have uh, performed with my colleagues, performs very, very well. It's a kind of something that uh, sometimes is not, I think, very uh, 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 to think about. So in our previous work, we have a focus on a code that's uh, CP2K. It's a code that in, uh, implements, quant it's for quantum chemistry and solid state physics. Uh, uh, physics. Uh, it uses the FT, but it mixes Gaussian, Gaussian bases with uh, plane, wave, uh, uh, plane waves. Uh, instead of getting a, a standard eigenvalue problem, as I showed in that cartoon here, the eigenvalue problem is actually uh, uh, generalized, but it just that that's just a detail. Uh, for the systems that we studied, using this formulation here for CP2K, we just used one of the partitions of the Cray XC40 system, that's Cori, that's going to be the commission in January. Uh, we used a very large partition that we could show a very good convergence properties and we could up, go up to 230 cores on that machine. That's basically what I'm showing here uh, in this and these figures, we had to look into different preconditioners for the problem, test the different preconditioners, and what we could see is that not always the best preconditioner in terms of accuracy is that is the one that leads to minimal time to solution. <coughs> Sometimes, or for more, I, I'd say for all the things we looked upon or looked at, the I get the, the precondition that's not very accurate takes more iterations, but it is very fast. It leads to uh, less time to solution. And we could be using, for example, a system uh, where we change the number of molecules, a system of bulk uh, water, increasing the size of the system using more uh, uh, molecules and doing a, doing a strong scaling. Uh, we could uh, analysis. We could see that well, in particular for 1,000 or 2,000 molecules of water, the, 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 the eigen so the eigen solver based on constraint minimization scaled very well. Where do we stand now? So we are, uh, the work in progress, uh, we are focused on the plan wave DFT. So this is important because this computation then it requires a lot, the way it's formulated, requires a lot of, uh, uh, it requires Fourier transforms, okay? It is, which is basically the important for this, uh, uh, for, for a matrix product that we had before, but here the matrix product requires uh, a fast Fourier. Uh, and the typical implementation, <laughs> if you're going to use a typical implementation of fast Fourier transform to perform matrix vector multiplications, uh, it takes more steps or a, 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 more steps than it is actually uh, that prevents you from getting good performance from the computers or the architectures that we have these days, in particular GPUs. So this is just a cartoon that shows, illustrates what a typical DFT, rather FFT is about, all the steps. But what we have seen uh, is that if you look at the communication and the calculations using a, a, a vanilla uh, FFT, 
The blue is basically what we have in communication in the various phases of the FT. FT, FT. The red is that the calculations. So you spend a lot of time doing communications, but this is uh, on a GPU. So what we want to do then is to recast or to modify the FFT to kind of do some sort of a fuse of the computations, use 1D and 3D FFTs in order to reduce the communication uh, and explore data locality, which is important for GPUs. So this is requires, as I said before, the change of the order in what the stages that were done in that previous cartoon are performed. And then we have to break the components into uh, the computation to smaller components. Just to have you an idea, now moving from GPU to an AMD system, just to give you an idea of what happens. So here we are talking about, it's a comparison that we use what we call a baseline uh, 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 code, a physics code that uses the FT, that's the P-TOT code that uses FFTW bus plus uh, BLAS that you can, even if the blast is optimized. And depending on the size of the system here, you can see that you spend a lot of time doing those. What we're comparing here is the different sizes of the FFT uh, of the system, how the distribution is done. And you can see compared to the blue, the blue is the baseline, how much faster you can go. That's basically the, the yellow and the red lines. You can go much, much faster if you basically change the, you know, to, to try to improve your calculations. And this is for an AMD system. It is, you know, just a CPU. This is what happens on an NVIDIA here. It's the same thing. You can get, if you know where to improve your FFT, you can get performance that's twice as better compared to the baseline. So what is the next step for us here? It's given the systems like permutural systems that have a, uh, uh, CPUs and GPUs is to put this, the pieces together. What I showed in the previous, this one in the previous slide is just one CPU, this is just one GPU. So the idea is to put all this together and uh, perform further comparisons and tests with the constraint functional. We started by doing this using a plain wave DFT using a code that's few box. It's a very powerful code, but it trades performance for general use and mostly doesn't have uh, support for GPUs. So what we have noticed is that FFT becomes non-trivial for working comparisons. And it plays an important, it's not the, the, the uh, uh, G GPU part per se, it also impacts the linear algebra calculations. The two things have to go hand by hand, okay? So what I have done then, we developed a proxy app uh, where we took, basically we are trying to mimic pieces of a, a, a physics code in order to perform a comparison of different FFT and different linear algebra setups in particular for uh, GPUs, as I said before. Uh, and then when we also have, we are done with this, we will then look into how integrate these developments into uh, production codes, right? Uh, what I didn't mention, okay, so before I get in there. So now in this proxy app, we have CG, the two versions, constraint and the constraint, and the different, <laughs> Eigenfolders that we will be able to compare in an easier way. We are doing this because if you look at uh, 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 the uh, workload that machines that we have, for example, at NERSC, uh, even in other centers, more than 25% of the cycles are spent with this kind of calculation in physics, in DFT uh, calculations. So that's the reason in order to get a better usage of the cycles of computers that are doing this big calculations. Uh, for um, uh, electro electronic uh, proper uh, structure properties. Final remarks. So we have seen in our previous work that the constraint CG offers good par scale, uh, parallel scalability not performance standard diagonalization. We presented this in a paper at ICPP in, in, uh, in Kyoto before COVID hit, that was in 2019, two years back. So in, that, in those studies, we use a localized basis set that then we can and also uh, there are some sparsity in the operators that we can advantage of. And what I'm, as I mentioned before, the ongoing future work, there is this implementation in a plain wave based framework. We are putting together and all the improvements CPU and GPUs, and then we will perform more uh, uh, tests and summit permuter, and also hysteria. We know that, that that's more kind of a vectorized system but we just got an account on this mysterious and then we'll be performing tests on a Fugaku-like system as well. 
uh, other, we are looking to also applying the sun constraint minimization formulation to other areas. It's the, the formulation is not restricted to physics. We have already performed some experiments uh, taking matrices from a matrix market, for example. And with that, thank you. If there are questions. This one. Again. They say something that you have not said. <laughs> okay. 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 I like to have a beer. presentation <laughs> 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 Well, I have to find how it works. Hi, so my name is Kohei Fujita from Earthquake Research Institute of University of Tokyo. I'm glad to be here to have a talk. Thank you for uh, invite, inviting me to have a talk here. So uh, these are the contents of my talk today. So uh, exploration of time history simulation using data-driven methods, uncertainty quantification of earthquake simulation based on stochastic simulation of thrust given probabilistic inputs and open ACC-based GPU porting of finite elements code. Okay, so uh, this is the acceleration of time history simulation using data-driven methods. So as an introduction, we are developing a general method to accelerate PD-based time history simulations using data-driven methods. Here we predict the initial solution of implicit solvers in PD-based time history simulation using data of previous time steps while running the simulation. And the application of this method to dynamic earthquake wave propagation problem enable a 26-fold speed up, which is scalable up to the full Fugaku system. So today I will show some results using this data-driven initial solution predictor on Earth's uh, viscoelastic crustal deformation problem. So our target problem is a large-scale PDE-based time history simulation solving sparse matrix equation many times. Here we solve the equation below for each of the many time steps where AN is the known sparse matrix, delta UN is the unknown vector, and FN is the known vector for time step N. And as AN is sparse and the degree of freedom is large, an iterative solver is used to solve equation one on massively parallel computer environment. So here we design an algorithm that accelerates solving huge problems where efficient combination of equation-based solving, uh, uh, equation-based and data-driven approach is done together under load balancing and reduced communication requirements for massively parallel computing. So here we use a data-driven method in scheme that assures the accuracy of the final solution. That is, we use the estimate initial solution of the iterative solver. Uh, here, we solve high-order modes prior to the iterative solver using results of previous time steps. Here, the time resolution matrix A is estimated as xn minus 1 equals axn minus 2. 
where the large X matrix is a series of previous S time step data. Here, transient loader modes that deteriorates the accuracy of data driven method is removed using an equation based predictor beforehand. And a data driven approach is used to obtain non transient high order modes. The data learning and inference is conducted in subdomains internal to the NTI process domain. So this becomes a communication free method scalable to large systems. <laughs> So uh, this is our target problem, the viscoelastic crustal deformation analysis, where we compute the viscoelastic response of Earth's crust to a given fault slip based on the governing equations. Here we use the data-driven predictor to estimate the initial solutions for adaptive conjugate gradient solver with hybrid algebraic uh, and geometric multigrid preconditioner. So this is the performance results on Sudaku. Here we compare performance with a three by three block Jacobi precondition conjugate gradient solver, PCGE, and the multigrid solver with initial solution with a standard initial solution predictor. So on 576 nodes, um, we obtained a speed up from 439 to 15.4 seconds, or uh, so we obtained a 28.5 fold speed up by the multigrid solver, and the further uh, 2.7 fold speed up was obtained with the data-driven method. And this method also uh, scaled up to 73,000 nodes of Fugaki. So uh, this is the next topic. We are doing a certificate quantification of earthquake simulation based on stochastic simulation of cross given probabilistic inputs. This is work uh, with the lead author, Professor Ishimura, and uh, the co-authors here from uh, uh, University of Tokyo, Fujitsu, uh, Jamstep, and uh, Riken, uh, Fujitsu, and Riken. So uh, in the background, uncertainty quantification is one of the keys to enhance HPC to high quality computing, and is especially important for simulations in fields with large effects of uncertainty, such as the earthquake simulation field. In this problem, the probabilistic space is solved in addition to the temporal and spatial domains with numerical convergence for assuring quality of simulation. That means we need to assure convergence in the probabilistic domain as well as in the spatial and temporal domains. So, for example, this problem can be solved by Monte Carlo simulation of determinic simulations, but this requires huge computational costs uh, compared to the determinic simulation, as in many samples are required for convergence of stochastic response. So, this is a summary of the results. We developed a super fast, super large scale stochastic finite element solver scalable up to the full Fugaku system. Uh, here, a highly efficient multigrid and mixed precision solver algorithm considering the characteristics of the solution space plus the high performance computation method suitable for Fudaku's system architecture is developed. And together with the automated generation of stochastic finite element method code in which high performance computing can be applied, we enable computing a 37 trillion degree of freedom model with. A 19% FP64 peak efficiency uh, with 87% weak scalability up to full Fugaku system, uh, which corresponds to a 224 fold speed up from the state of the art method on Summit. And with this, we enabled uncertainty quantification of an actual cross structure model with 32 trillion degrees of freedom model. So uh, this is the cross with uh, uncertainty. Uh, in the material properties. And for a given input, bulk slip input, we can compute the displacement uh, and also the stress response uh, in the cross uh, with some uncertain or the stochastic response. And these are showing the stochastic response. And we can see that the, uh, we can uh, do uncertainty quantification of this very large scale model using our method. So last, I will talk about the OpenACC-based GPU porting of a finite element code. This work is uh, by uh, Ryota Kusakabe, a former student 
in Earthquake Research Institute at the University of Tokyo, and uh, these co-authors from the University of Tokyo and JAMSTE. So we will talk this topic in uh, Friday's workshop in uh, WACC PD. So as an overview of finite element earthquake simulation is uh, mostly costly kernel is become sparse matrix vector product. And in case of CPU-based systems, methods storing matrix on memory, such as CRS or ELL, are widely used. However, in the case of GPUs with relatively high arithmetic performance, an element-by-element method uh, is, can be an alternative. So an element-by-element uh, element method uh, generates an element matrices on the fly during matrix vector products and adds element-wise results to the left-hand side vector. And this implementation is possible by use of directive-based programming models such as OpenACC with uh, similar efficiency to native programming models such as CUDA. So these are some performance results. So we measured performance of matrix vector products on second order tetrahedral elements in the three by three block CRS uh, method and the EBE method. So here, the first one is uh, performance on Sugaku. The Sugaku has uh, six teraflops FP32 peak with one terabyte uh, memory bandwidth. So we can see the memory bandwidth is relatively high. In this case, the block CRS and the EBE has similar performance and, uh, and uh, the block CRS is a little bit faster. And uh, in case of A100 GPU, which has a uh, fast arithmetics, uh, here we have 19 teraflops performance and memory bandwidth of 1.5 terabytes. So compared to Tsugaku, the memory bandwidth is uh, uh, relatively slower. And so in this machine, uh, we can get better performance using EVE. And uh, the OpenACC version is a uh, similar performance to that obtained by a CU sparse library. And uh, for the newest generation H100 NVIDIA GPUs, uh, we can also get good performance by using EBE. And in particular, if we tune our method, particularly for the H100 GPUs, we can get the further speed up of 2.1 fold from the A100 GPU. So from these uh, measurements, we can see that by using a, a suitable method for matrix vector products, we can achieve good performance on CPU and also GPU. And uh, by doing this kind of thing, we can uh, port our uh, finite element codes to the OpenMP, uh, OpenACC for GPU environments. Okay, so this is a summary of my talk. We, uh, showed acceleration of time history simulations using data-driven methods uh, with learning and interesting while conducting a uh, simulation. We can get a 2.7-fold speed up achieved over a highly efficient multigrid solver. And we also showed uncertainty quantification of earthquake simulation. Here, a stochastic simulation of cross given uh, probabilistic input was shown. And we enabled a 200-fold speed up from uh, deterministic state of the art simulation on summit by development of stochastic finite element solver scalable on both Fugaku. Uh, also, we showed open ACC based GPU porting of the finite element code, and we showed acceleration of matrix vector products possible by use of element by element method on GPUs with open ACC. So that uh, concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you.